With the COVID-19 pandemic disrupting daily life, we've been adjusting to this new normal using digital platforms and video conferencing to make up for face-to-face -face interactions, telecommuting, increasing delivery services, and even deploying robots where we can. As this pandemic stretches on, it's becoming clear to us that some elements of this highly digitalized lifestyle are here to stay. But that means the role of big tech will be expanding in our lives and also compromises jobs for thousands, possibly millions of people around the world. To discuss what this new normal could entail, we connect with Jeremy Kaplan, Editor-in-Chief of Digital Trends, joining us from New York, and Dr. Kim Byung-ju, Professor at Hanguk University of Foreign Studies in Seoul. My first question to you, Mr. Kaplan. Earlier this year, when we spoke at CES, you said you were excited about uh, the wave of digital healthcare devices and solutions this year, as well as the acceleration of AI technology. But since then, we've seen the situation change with this pandemic. What are now some digital trends and services you expect to last beyond the virus and become part of the new normal? Yeah, exactly. I'm glad you said that part of the new normal, because I keep hearing that phrase thrown around as if we're in the new normal right now. I think we're in the new abnormal. This is a very weird time for all of us. And I think what's going to be interesting is how much of what we're doing today carries forwards into the near future. So I think there's some obvious things, the video conferencing, for example, people have realized how useful this tool is, not just high tech industries, not just certain white collar uh, companies, but lots of companies are going to find that to be useful going forwards. I think education is going to be profoundly transformed as well. Um, a lot of easy things. It's also very clear that online shopping has become massively pervasive. Uh, most people, well, I step back, several people had been doing this before. Personally, I was doing almost all of my shopping online, but that was not the case for the, the bulk of people. And I think going forwards, online shopping will certainly become an enormous transformation. And I think the biggest thing we should watch for is what we call the sharing economy, right? Uh, there are companies that will let you share your car, share your house, share your bicycle. Uh, in this world we're in right now, no one wants to do any of that. It'll be very interesting to see how many of those companies actually survive and whether the sharing economy is still a thing six, eight months from now. So you're saying that we could possibly see the decline of the sharing economy while we see increasing use of online platforms and services. Well, Dr. Decline, BJ Kim, or perhaps even complete collapse. Right. Well, Dr. BJ Kim, um, in South Korea, we're calling the use of these digital platforms and non-contact services and payments as the untapped economy. Do you think these services will continue to grow even when the pandemic and social distancing measures are over? And which companies do you think will have actually gained the most during this trying time? Yeah, my answer to that first question is definitely, absolutely, that's the case. Uh, you know, people, uh, as Mr. Kaplan said, people has shown their preference of uh, staying out of contact if possible, even before the time of coronavirus. Uh, and uh, we've seen some of the industries uh, growing based on that trend. And uh, Mr. Kaplan was sa saying, uh, they're talking about his uh, ordering things to the online even before corona came here. Uh, the thing is, uh, yes, indeed, uh, that trend has been with us, but it has been very dramatically accelerated because of the coronavirus case here. and. Uh, I think people are discovering some of the advantages of using, taking advantages of this, uh, you know, technological foundation that we have had so far. So even after the coronavirus peak is over, I'm sure a lot of people will choose to stay with the technology and options. And uh, companies also, they might find it advantageous to let, in, uh, you know, encourage people to telecommute if possible, because we have now strengthened our basis for, uh, you know, like going with this kind of uh, uh, the, the economic activities without face-to-face without -face contact. So definitely uh, the trend is going to continue. The sec second question about the companies. I'm, in, I'm staying in Sejong right now and uh, in Sejong city in Korea because it's an administrative city. Uh, government officials stay here but they have lots of things going on in Seoul. So over the years, for the past about five, six, seven years, uh, government officials here have been using these technologies like messaging services and uh, uh, document sharing services uh, on the go back and forth between Seoul and Sejong. And these technology companies in Korea that have been developing this kind of options uh, have been doing pretty well, and they are doing even better because of the virus case right now. And there are the companies they are going to face brighter face, the brighter future as we move forward. 
So it seems that you were uh, is expecting this transition to a highly digitalized lifestyle to happen anyway, but this virus has really accelerated the process. Well, then with the growth of these remote services and uh, automated business solutions as well, how are they going to affect people's jobs and livelihoods in the future, Dr. Kim? I mean, more than 26 million people in the US have already lost their jobs in the recent weeks, and worldwide, 75 million are expected to be laid off over the course of the pandemic. We have to be clear about the, what's happening in terms of unemployment situation. We, we have to be mindful that the unemployment itself is taking place because of the economic downturn. Uh, because we cannot uh, you know, go shopping face to face, we cannot uh, gather around, like cannot go, go to movie theaters, for instance, and, uh, you know, because of the virus. I, I, so it's an economic downturn that's causing the unemployment. I don't think actually the, the rise of the uh, services and technology that's uh, offering like uh, option for us to do things without face face to face contact with other people. I don't think it's it's the case. So uh, the the economic downturn itself is an issue, and the technology itself. Some of the economists will say it will create even uh, more jobs. Who knows? I mean, you, you know, like a delivery service, for instance, in Korea, a delivery service has been uh, quite uh, active because of the. Uh, virus situation here and so it's a hard call to make at this point whether the technology itself will cause you know or keep the unemployment numbers in in a in in, in a large scale or not uh, I, certainly I can see certain aspect to it but I don't think it's a major one the the uh, recovering from the economic downturn is the most important task that we have to uh, undertake in order to deal with the unemployment situation that we face at this point so we can't really rule out the um, endless possibilities that tech might actually bring. Well, uh, Mr. Kaplan, some companies like uh, Hilton are helping their employees find other work in the meantime over the course of the pandemic to keep their income levels steady. Will large companies uh, like Hilton be expected to play a greater role in society, especially in terms of providing a safety net for their workers? Yeah, it's a really interesting question. Um, certainly amongst our readers, we've noticed that uh, the younger audience is looking for companies to have some sort of a social good component or element or message even to what they do. And you see that across a broad spectrum of things. You have companies like Tom's, the shoe company that uh, gives away a pair of shoes for every shoe that it's sold. That has done very well with consumers because people like that. Uh, we've seen that increasing with the bigger technology companies especially. So companies like Intel, uh, IBM, uh, uh, Ford have been retooling factories uh, repurposing engineers to build ventilators just seems like the kind of thing that is important to do at a time like this. But the message from some of those big companies has been very clear that they feel a need to become a part, be a, a force for good here. And we see that the need for that or the desire for that kind of a message from consumers, I think increasingly there is an important role that companies like this have to face, especially among larger tech, technology companies, which have seen a lot of blowback uh, in the larger population in the press and in the conversation across the globe because of concerns around privacy. So any effort that they can, they can take to mitigate that I think is going to be very well received these days. So speaking of privacy issues, uh, tech giants are also playing a very big role in facilitating the health and safety of the public during this pandemic, as well as enabling telework and communication, of course. But this really involves using location data from smartphones um, to contact tracing, to do contract tra tracing and uh, they're also needing a lot of health information as well. And this kind of surveillance would have been rather inconceivable a few months ago. There have also been privacy concerns with video conferencing platforms like Zoom. What could be done then to protect our privacy and security? Yeah, yeah privacy feels sort of like a moving target sometimes. Um, I remember reading a study a few years back after a major hurricane, looking at the information that people were willing to share online before the event. Nobody wanted their location information out there. They were terrified that it was going to be available. And then during the hurricane, you're madly typing, I'm in exact, here's the exact room that I'm in at this exact address, because it feels like a different amount of information is acceptable. I think right now, this broad sweeping collection of data aggregation for, uh, for the good of the, of the public is meaningful and useful. But there's two key watchwords here, right? It's going to be transparency and accountability. So. We need to know exactly where the data is going. And as long as that is revealed and clear, I think it's fine. And if there's abuse of that data, uh, of that information, of, of that confidentiality, companies need to be held accountable for it. And as long as we can meet those two standards, I think there shouldn't be any problems. 
Right, so accountability and transparency. Uh, just before we go, Dr. Kim, then how can we make sure that these companies do practice transparency and accountability as their, daily, as their presence really continues to encroach on our daily lives? Yeah, uh, somehow interestingly today I find myself agreeing a lot with Mr. Kaplan's points here. <laughs> and the uh, government's role, rather than you know, regulating other aspects of the, uh, you know, the business activities, it needs to be focused on uh, disclosure of the information, uh, you know, the, how they're using the the client or consumer data that's being aggregated and it's always kind of technically really challenging for ordinary citizens to comprehend uh, you know when such information is released just just uh, offhand so government should take an efforts to make the information you know, easily uh, comprehensible and uh, make it simple and then let people know how the data being collected by these big companies and tech companies are being used uh, for the for the purpose of their business profit. And that's going to be a really key role for the government so that we can have a better decision, collective decision making in this system of democracy going forward. Yeah, Dr. Kim makes a great point because it's too easy for a company to put out a 40 page disclosure statement that no one can read. That's a huge problem, especially in the technology industry. So it's up to governments to ensure that those, that information when it's disclosed is actually digestible and meaningful. So really improving the uh, literacy of everyday people to be able to understand and digest these uh, privacy terms. I'm afraid that's all we have time for today, but it's been a wonderful discussion. Thank you, uh, th thank you Dr. Pyongju Kim and Jeremy Kaplan for joining us from New York and Seoul. Thank you. This is also where we end the show today. Thank you for watching. We'll be back at the same time tomorrow. We hope you join us then. Bye-bye.